This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to Hide.me slash Epicenter and sign up for a free account today. And by Jax. Jax is a user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to JAX.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Sergio Lerner. Uh, he is a, as a Bitcoin developer. Some people may know him from some of his blog posts. He wrote this blog post about sort of the, the original coins of Satoshi that got a lot of attention. He was also uh, one of the people hired by the Bitcoin Foundation to do security audits of the code. So once he was working there and, and today he is one of the founders of, of Rootstock, which I'm sure many have heard of, which is essentially bringing a smart contract functionality similar to Ethereum to the Bitcoin network. So I'm super excited to have you on set here. Thank you, Brian and Sebastian to host this show. Yeah, no, and, and, and thanks for your work. Now, um, we talked briefly before the show about sort of how you got involved in Bitcoin. Can you, can you tell us a story? Like what was the original sort of your way into this space and community? Well, first of all, uh, my background is on computer security. So when I, when I uh, learned about Bitcoin, I was completely uh, su su surprised by this. It, this was fantastic for me. And uh, I started doing what I, what I do. I started reading the code, trying to find any kind of vulnerability. And I remember having spent a lot of time researching and trying to understand the system because it, it seemed to me that was perfect. And I, I dedicated so much time that actually I started, I, I found a couple of vulnerabilities. And, uh, and one of them was very, very fun and very uh, interesting that allowed uh, the attacker to shoot down the whole Bitcoin network. And it was, this, this was 2012, I think. And, uh, and I, 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 I sent an email to the, the Bitcoin development team uh, at that time. And they, they were really, really uh, heard my, my, what I had to say, and they fixed it. And that's why I, I get involved. And I started to become a kind of a, a auditor of the Bitcoin uh, code and going after each, each of the changes of the code every month. I, I took some time to, 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 to audit and from time to time I, I, I found some, something interesting. And, but what, I, I spent a year working for Bitcoin without even having a single Bitcoin myself. I was helping the community, I was helping, uh, but I did not have Bitcoin. So I, it was uh, 2013 that I wanted to invest. But I knew that there was some missing part of the history of Bitcoin that was the first year. So what was happening in the first year? Where were the, those, all those coins that had been mined? And, and it, that was important for me to, be a, to, to feel sure that I could invest. So I, I started researching about that and I found out that uh, there was a pattern that later I called the Satoshi pattern, which linked all, most of these uh, coin bases, the, the generation of new coins, and it, it, uh, it seems that it, all those coins belong to a single entity. So I, 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 I had a lot of arguments in the, in the forums about this. Uh, a lot of people uh, told me I was completely wrong, but when I presented the evidence in my blog, uh, it was so clear that I, I had like 35,000 visits in a single day. And, uh, and, and my blog had, had no more than 10 visits in a day. So for me, that's, that was... Astonishing, uh, and that week I, I, I got a very interesting call from the key, key people on the Bitcoin community, and one of the calls was from Wences Casares. Was was he was the CEO of uh, Zappo Wallet, and he told me, "Come to my office. I want to, to to talk with you." And I went to talk with him. It was a very interesting talk. But after 15 minutes, he said, "Okay, you have to come with me to San Jose to the this Bitcoin conference." You have to be part of this. You have to tell everyone. You have to tell what you know. And I said, I, I, he told me, I pay for everything. I pay for the, I, I, he gave me his, his own uh, 
hotel room and, 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 and I, I, plane tickets. And I, I invite you all, everything. And because I knew him for a very, very uh, few time, very short time, I say no. And the other day he called me again and say, are you coming? And I say, okay, I'm going, this is, this is it. So I went to the, the, the conference and it, it, it was amazing. And it also it was funny because I was sitting in, in, a, in tables there with other people and, and then people started t talking about me, uh, about the, the, the research I did. I n no one knew how, how I looked. So I, I said, hey, it's me, it's me. <laughs> so it was funny. <laughs> And we danced on the on the stage with uh, Peter Schramm. That it, we were all so excited at, at those times. And for the first time in my life, I felt I was part of something. Uh, I, I'm completely agnostic to everything. So this, this was the first time I say, okay, this is a place where I can develop myself and I can feel to be to be part of a, a movement. So it, it was a very interesting uh, uh, time for me. Cool. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And do you still do that uh, to to look at all the Bitcoin changes uh, and the uh, pips to see if there's any kind of new vulnerabilities or security holes? Yes, I'm not as often as I used to. Uh, the last uh, vulnerability that I I, I uh, found was uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, and it was not uh, critical, but it was interesting. Uh, so I, I do it, not not as often as I as I like to but uh, uh, RSK have me uh, completely focus on this platform 25 hours a day I sleep thinking about RSK and I get up thinking about RSK and that's a, that's my my current uh, project now cool so uh, then let's let's get into that so tell us uh, how did you get the idea for uh, RSK for rootstock uh, well the, the idea of creating a smart contract platform was actually uh, before Rootstock, it was uh, it was in uh, 2012, 2013, and because of my uh, university thesis was on peer-to-peer -peer poker, uh, I wanted to create this system where one can, could create applications, distributed applications, to play peer-to-peer uh, -peer poker in a completely fair uh, way. So I created a prototype which was called Quizcoin, which was a Turing-complete uh, platform. Um, but the only applications that I built was uh, applications for, for playing poker. So that, that was, uh, and, uh, and I tried to convince everyone that that was the future, but you know, it was so focused on, 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 on playing uh, so that I didn't see the financial implications, the enormous uh, financial possibilities of having a, a smart contract platform. And so then Ethereum came up, uh, and, and with all these uh, interesting new ideas of uh, use cases, and I decided that I wanted to be uh, a part of this, uh, this endeavor. I, I wanted to create smart contract platforms. So uh, last year, uh, I, I had the, the, this opportunity to, to meet the right people uh, in the right time, and one of them was Diego Gutierrez Saldivar, which, uh, which is uh, one of the founding members of the Latin American Bitcoin uh, movement, uh, so, uh, and, and, and another great people here in Buenos Aires, so we decided that, that this was the right moment to create a smart contract platform specifically for Bitcoin, to add value to Bitcoin, and, 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 uh, and also to bring balance to the force. We, we were seeing that in the ecosystem there was a lot of arguments between uh, industries, miners, uh, uh, core developers, and we wanted to create something that we could make everyone to be part of, and still to be to be a Bitcoin project, essentially a Bitcoin project, because we we we, we believe in Bitcoins. So that that was my next question. Then, with, with all of the with all of the uh, I guess uh, um, well, what we've seen lately, lack of governance, uh, and the inability for the Bitcoin community to sort of come together around certain very important decisions. Why did you feel it would be? Uh, how, how did you? How did you think you would achieve um, such a thing in in such a divided community? Mm -hmm. Because in in RSK we are trying to have every uh, um, participant have a stake in the in the platform. Every participant to be to be part of in, in the governance model. So we we are adding a proof of stake for uh, people who have uh, actual Bitcoins in our platform to be able to vote. Miners are able to vote. 
And we also have a federation of renowned uh, industry companies that will vote on protocol changes. And uh, full nodes also will vote using uh, a new protocol um, to, to allow them to, to prove that they, they owned a copy of the blockchain. So we are trying to change that. We are trying to show uh, that this, is ca this can be done. So obviously, there, this is uh, uh, something that uh, we, are, we are very excited about. But uh, I, I hope we can, we can um, um, make this goal reality. So um, that's, that's very interesting. Do you think in the future maybe, do you have an expectation that if this works out with Rootstock that maybe uh, Bitcoin would start using some of the same ways to decide on protocol changes and upgrades? Uh, I'm not sure if Bitcoin is going to change its ethos, uh, its, its essence. And, and it's, it, that's, that's correct. I mean, Bitcoin uh, it's been built to be eternal. It's been built to be uh, 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 very hard to change, and that's okay. That's the Bitcoin we want it to be. We want Bitcoin to be strong, the strongest as possible, uh, and the, the decentralized as possible. But by giving an example of how we can we can get all the parties in a, in agreement, I think we will lower the uh, the fights in Bitcoin community. We will make the Bitcoin community more fond of each other because of uh, seeing the, the the example in Rootstock in in Earth K. So it's more by showing an example. It's not that something that we want Bitcoin to change. I think it's that we can show a different way of doing the things. So you talked before that when you, you first got interested in smart contract and Turing complete cryptocurrency, uh, you had the use case of, of gaming, uh, gambling in mind. Yeah. Uh, what what is today? What are the use cases and areas that excite you today that you think Rootstock is going to address? Well, the the the, the thing that uh, put us together, the whole group of founders here in in in, in RSK, it's that we think that the smart contract platform essentially provides financial inclusion, the possibility to to transact at a lower uh, lower fees. And, uh, and and really to allow people to be their own bank w using smart wallets. So essentially, because we live in a, in the underdeveloped country, and we we've, we've seen that uh, there are billions of people that do not have access to bank accounts or they don't even trust banks anymore uh, because of the different defaults we have here in Argentina. So we see this platform essentially as a means to bring uh, financial inclusion to people. And that's that's our main uh, goal, and we we are working with integrators in in Latin America that are bringing financial institutions to create micro lending platforms uh, to create uh, smart wallets, and uh, and I, I think this will be the the main use case. Of course, I'm very excited about anything uh, the the future uh, that the the, the the great thinkers of uh, of new applications or distributed autonomous organizations, but we think that. There is a, um, a essentially a, a, a use case for financial inclusion that it's greater than any other um, future uh, idea. Yeah, that, that, that's fantastic, and I think it, it's it's really interesting that uh, a project such as Rootstock is coming from uh, Buenos Aires rather than you know some European country or the United States, and and that gives it definitely a, a different. Uh, viewpoint and uh, from from where the technology is being developed. So uh, yeah, these these sort of use cases are definitely not the same as you know what perhaps the Ethereum team are thinking of or some other uh, platform being developed here uh, in the developed world. Um, so let's get into some of the technical aspects of Rootstock. Can you give us a high level overview, and then we'll we'll come down into the different uh, layers of the stack. But give us a high level overview of what Rootstock looks like technically. Okay, so. Rootstock uh, is basically a smart contract platform that relies on three pillars. Uh, one of the pillars is that we are doing merge mining. So we are using Bitcoin uh, hashing power, the Bitcoin mining network, to secure our own blockchain. And at the same time, we are providing the Bitcoin miners a new revenue stream so they can uh, withstand uh, the Bitcoin halving and they can get uh, more uh, rewards from the, the work they do. And you, you know that merge mining is a technique where 
the Bitcoin miners use the same hardware they are using for mining Bitcoins and with the same cost uh, to mine a different cryptocurrency, in this case, the RSK uh, platform. Uh, the second pillar is that we are doing, we are using Bitcoin as the native currency. So we are not creating a new speculative currency. And that's very important for us because we, we don't want to compete with Bitcoin. We think the, the stronger the Bitcoin is, the stronger the RSK platform will be. So to create, to, to use Bitcoin in our platform, we need a way to exchange Bitcoins between the Bitcoin platform, the Bitcoin blockchain, and the RSK, the RSK blockchain. And that system is uh, it's, it's called two-way peg. And there are several ways actually to, to implement a, a two-way peg. One is the sidechain concept that was developed by a Blockstream. And the other is uh, the drive chain concept that was developed by Pulse Torque. And the third one is basically having a set of notaries that have um, uh, custody of the funds that are transferred to the Rooster platform. And what we have actually created is a hybrid system that combines all these three parts. So in the Rooster side, we have a side chain. In the Bitcoin side, we have a mix, a mixture of a federation and, uh, and a drive chain, which allows uh, miners and a set of renowned parties to have this compound custody of the bitcoins that are transferred to the to the Rooster platform. But uh, this uh, this federation has no authority nor no way of uh, uh, of uh, making you uh, of uh, uh, an authorized uh, use of the bitcoins that are transferred to the Bitcoin platform to the sorry to the RSK platform. Because uh, this works, in the RSK platform, there is a contract, uh, it's a smart contract, which we call the Bridge Master, which orchestrates the creation of Bitcoin transactions and the Bitcoin, uh, the, the, the Federation only has to take these transactions, sign them and put them in the Bitcoin network. So they have no uh, authority to create their own transactions. But at the same time, we are uh, working with uh, some of the most important Bitcoin uh, uh, companies, such as uh, e-wallets and exchanges. So we are pretty sure that we will get uh, a very, very high level of uh, security for the, the custody of the Bitcoins that are transferred to the RSK platform. In a very few weeks, we'll have a press release where we will announce which are the parties, which are the companies that uh, are taking part of this uh, of this federation. Oh, and uh, the th the third pillar of the Rustock platform that I didn't mention is that we are creating a high volume, very scalable blockchain. So we will we will be able to to rise the transaction per second to probably 300 transactions per second, and we allow this by uh, trading off a little bit of decentralization. Uh, for for scalability, so Bitcoin is essentially fully decentralized, and we are maybe in the middle between super scalable blockchain and a, and a complete decentralized blockchain. Let's take a short break to talk about Hi.me. You know you need a VPN provider to protect yourself against those nasty hackers trying to steal your private information. With Hi.me, it couldn't be easier. You just install their application on all your devices, iOS or Android, log in and you have a cushiony, cozy tunnel in which your data can move freely and unencumbered, all the while protecting you from those mean old hackers. Now that's boom. To sign up for the free plan, go to hike.me slash epicenter. The best thing is when you use that URL, if you ever go premium later, you're going to get 35% off and premium comes with unlimited bandwidth using up to five devices at the same time. You can use all their servers worldwide. You can pay with Bitcoin. And best of all, it comes with a feeling of peace and satisfaction, like having tea with the Dalai Lama. We would like to thank Hi.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Okay, that's, that, that's super fascinating. So RSK essentially is, is it the first, the first real project, right? That's uh, pursuing the this original side chains vision at this point. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it's that's correct. Um, I think Paul Stork is also working on a project that will be um, 
implement this as a drive chain, and, but uh, I, I think we will be the first to use this technology. And, and can you talk a little bit, because with, with Bitcoin, uh, I remember with the sidechain things, there was a lot of talk that, you know, a hard fork is needed in order to, you know, have a proper two-way peg, but then there is this kind of intermediary solution or intermediate solution where you have a, a, a federation, uh, a federated peg. Um, how do you view that? So would, would Rootstock uh, use a federated peg first? And, and how important would it be to make those protocol changes down the line? Um, I think it's, it's very important for the, for the project to be able to move from the federated peg to the, the fully uh, autonomous peg. And uh, we've created a new uh, Bitcoin improvement proposal, which is uh, open and online. And we've, uh, we are working on the implementation of the proposal. And this proposal uh, creates a new opcode to be able to create a drive chain on the Bitcoin side. So we are using uh, an idea that we call progressive decentralization, which is basically that no system, no consensus system, no blockchain can go from completely centralized control to fully decentralized control. The, the, there should be intermediate steps to go from one point to the other to get assurance that the network is uh, 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 performing as desired. So basically, this new opcode uh, allows to, to move uh, from a federated peg into a, a system where the miners vote. Uh, th th this is not a vote, sorry. This is an algorithmic vote. It's, a, it's actually an acknowledge system where the miners are, allow, are allowed to um, um, Algorithm, algorithmically vote to release Bitcoin funds and obeyed by the, uh, the smart contract uh, breach in the RSK blockchain. So basically, we start with a full federation and we move into a system where the number of uh, algorithmic votes by the federation is reduced and the number of algorithm votes by the miners are, is increased. And this is a dynamic balance. So if, uh, if at any time the number of, of uh, miners engaged in merge mining the RSK network goes down, automatically the number of, of algorithm, algorithmic votes the federation uh, has to assign its uh, increases. So uh, at, at the end of, the, of the, uh, the, 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 this uh, period, we hope that we have full engagement of the Bitcoin miners in merge mining. So before we get into mining and scalability, to refresh everyone's memory and including mine, can you sort of explain the difference between a federated peg and a fully decentralized peg and how both of those work in, in reality, like okay. in, in, a, in a real use case? So a federated peg, it's a, it's a system where basically the, there is a set of notaries, we have a multi-signature. And so to send Bitcoins to the... Um, RSK blockchain, you basically send them to what we call an exit address. The exit address is at one of the address of the uh, federators. So automatically, when you send funds to this address, you can create an SPP proof on the RSK side that allows you to convert those uh, those bitcoins that were locked in the federator federator address into bitcoins living in the Rootstock, in the RSK blockchain. So basically, moving funds from Bitcoin to RSK is automatically. The other way around, moving funds from RSK into Bitcoin requires the collaboration of the federators. And how it is performed is that basically the whole system works on chain. So there is a smart contract that is the bridge master which holds uh, a Bitcoin wallet and controls all the unspent transaction outputs that were part of uh, the transfers to the exit addresses. So basically, this contract creates a transaction. This transaction is broadcast to the, to the federators by using a, a, a log message on, a, on, the, on the smart contract platform. The federators receive this transaction. They send signatures as on-chain messages to the uh, bridge master. The bridge master combines all these messages, all these signatures, 
into a, leaf, a fully uh, signed transaction, and then this transaction is also um, broadcast uh, using a log uh, opcode uh, in the in the RSK blockchain, and any user, including of course the federators, take this transaction and put this transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. So essentially, the the this set of notaries, the federation, they cannot choose which uh, output to spend, they cannot choose which uh, the destination address where the funds have to be transferred. It's all being orchestrated by a smart contract. If they uh, wish to cheat, they will have to create a fully off-chain uh, automated system to create uh, transactions out of the system. But this, this of course, is not going to be uh, possible because these are the federation have a reputation that they protect. They are part of the Bitcoin industry. And how will these uh, federators be picked? Uh, so let's, let's maybe talk about the governance model a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, how will you choose these federators and how will they get be renewed, uh, uh, I guess, on some sort of annual basis or something like that? Okay, so we are choosing the federators to be the, the most important companies in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And again, this will be uh, in a press release very soon. But uh, we aim to have at least several federators from each continent, uh, from each geography. So this is not something local to any country. So this has to be a federator of uh, very, very uh, important companies all over the world. So we, have, we already have uh, companies in the US, in Europe, in Africa, in South America, in Asia. And these are the, the, some of the most uh, well-known exchanges. So these this, uh, federators, they, also, they already have uh, security policies. They already have auditors, security auditors. So it's not that anyone can become a federator. To become a federation, you have to meet certain uh, policies, procedural policies and security policies. So these companies already have these policies on place to protect the private keys that allow them to control the multi-signature. Today's magic word is ROOTS, R-O-O-T-S. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. You mentioned scalability before uh, and that uh, ROOTSTOCK was uh, was more scalable. Can you talk a little bit about like how does that work, and you know what, what's the limiting factor that's keeping it to three hundred transactions at this time? Okay, there are two limiting factors in scalability. One is storage. Essentially, the, the main, the most important factor is storage. The, the question is how many nodes, how many full nodes do you wish to have? How many full nodes? It's enough to have a decentralized network. So some people would say that uh, 5,000 nodes is enough. Some people would say that 100 nodes is if it's enough if they are distributed all over the world and, and there is no single party controlling them. So Bitcoin has approximately 5,000 uh, full nodes. And if we get to the point with, where we have 1,000 nodes, full nodes, then we are OK. We, we don't want to be as decentralized as Bitcoin, but we, are, we want to be pretty decentralized. So essentially, we are asking full nodes to have more powerful uh, computers and more storage as a Bitcoin. Uh, from the technical point of view, uh, there are several things you have to change from the uh, transaction processing to be able to create a, uh, to a scale. Basically, what we are doing now, uh, not for the first release, but for the second release, is that we are partitioning the transactions in a block into non-overlapping sets. So basically, we can uh, process the transaction in parallel. If you compare this to uh, uh, Ethereum, for example, Ethereum serializes all the transactions. So if two transactions actually interact with the same uh, contract, basically, those transactions cannot be separated. And so we have a, a system for separating transactions uh, as um, if they don't interact with each other. So we are able to parallelize the processing and the execution. At the same time, we are creating a, a new VM, which is 
uh, we has, it has a just-in-time compiler. So essentially, we can process more instructions per second. And that's another step towards uh, scalability. And probably the last step uh, that helps scalability is having uh, probabilistic verification and fraud proofs. And that's a, an, still another important step that we are working on. And um, also, this is something that other blockchains also do, is that another, another thing that prevents you from scaling is that when you create a new full node and you want to enter the network, you, you, you want to download the, the, the full history. And our blockchain and other blockchains too allow to download only the state, the current state of the network, and you can ask the federators for a signed checkpoint so that you can make sure that that state uh, is, a, is a state that you, you can trust uh, until you start getting the information, the historic information. Uh, so you can basically start from one point and at the same time download historic information. And this is uh, very similar to what Bitcoin is doing with uh, pruning, the, the pruning uh, system. Cool, but very interesting. Now, I presume, or would there ever be a scenario where one would want several different root stock, uh, root stocks tied to Bitcoin, or or should will there always be sort of you know Bitcoin and then there's one root stock uh, chain? Oh, uh, this this uh this is something I I I I've thought many times of what would be the main blockchain that will survive on the block on the, on the long run which which are the basic needs uh, of for blockchains and i think that of course the storage value and bitcoin is essentially the the main important the, the most important a smart contracts it's becoming uh, uh, of uh, uh, greater importance as as time passes but also uh, anonymous transactions and private transactions uh, private contracts it's something that will uh, rise in, uh, uh, a lot. I, I'm very, very interested in seeing what happens with uh, said cash, uh, Sucos project. So I think that that can be one of the uh, second side chains to Bitcoin, a completely anonymous cryptocurrency. That can be also uh, a completely anonymous system for Bitcoin to become uh, anonymous. Sorry, and I, I see that uh, these uh, these two. Uh, side chains, uh, uh, anonymous anonymous uh, transactions and smart contracts are the main the main ones. But I I, I also see some others uh, competing, and that's 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 fine. I mean the 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 Bitcoin improvement proposal we are we are um, proposing is allows any number of uh, side chains or drive chains to be to be developed. So we want to see collaboration. We want to see uh, most more of these projects, and we also are very, very open to collaboration with Ethereum and with Dash and some a, a, any project. There is a lot to learn. There is, I, I really think there is no competition at this stage of the ecosystem. Uh, basically, we all want uh, the blockchains to be as secure as possible. We don't want uh, security incidents uh, as the, the DAO or anything. We want uh, people to believe this is a technology that is going to change the world. Let's talk about Ethereum in a second. You mentioned the term drive chains a few times, if I understood correctly. Can you explain what's the difference between a, a drive chain and a side chain? Well, a, a, a side chain is a system where essentially one blockchain evaluates the consensus system of another blockchain. Basically, one, one blockchain has to understand SPB proofs of another blockchain in order to accept uh, uh, and uh, a set of he an SPB proof, which basically contains a transaction and a set of confirmation headers, as as proof of that uh, some transaction has happened in a, in another blockchain. Uh, but when you implement a side chain uh, combined with a merge mining system, basically you don't get you don't get more security as basically letting letting the miners acknowledge this, that this transaction has happened on the other blockchain. So basically, in the pres in, if you are going to implement a, uh, a sidechain where you are going to do merge mining, then essentially, basically what you can do is uh, allow miners to 
boat, but this is an algorithmic boat, this is not a human boat, uh, on the state of the other blockchain. So main, miners basically pass information between one blockchain and the other blockchain. So uh, this, is, uh, this is essential. Essentially, uh, miners uh, vote on the, on the Coinbase addresses, uh, and they, uh, if there is a majority of, uh, of uh, these tags in the Coinbase, in the Coinbase, um, Coinbase fields, they, they uh, unlock Bitcoins. I don't know if, if I was uh, uh, <laughs> precise enough, but you can you can take a look at the Bitcoin improvement proposal in our uh, in our uh, GitHub repository. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, just what what number is that? Well, it, we have not presented it yet to the Bitcoin community because we are working on the implementation. So it, it has a. I, I will send the the link so you can publish that. Great. Yeah. So we'll put that in the in the show notes. So you mentioned Ethereum before, and of course that's the first thing that will come to the mind of many people when they hear about Rootstock, when they hear about smart contracts. Um, in particular, I'm curious about the virtual machine. So, so I, Rootstock also has a virtual machine. Ethereum has the Ethereum virtual machine, the EVM. Like, how are those two different or similar? Well. Uh, at the first release, we are fully compatible with the Ethereum VM. We actually have taken uh, part of the Ethereum VM in a very, very uh, interesting project, which is called Ethereum J. Um, uh, so we basically took the VM so we can be fully compatible with Ethereum. So uh, in the first release, by the end of the year, you will be able to basically take an Ethereum application and run it on the Rootstock on the RSK blockchain. And this is important for us because we want to give uh, Ethereum developers um, another platform so they can test their applications and they can develop their solutions. And uh, from, that, from, from that point uh, on, we are creating our own improvements to the EVM. Basically, we are creating a new VM and doing a dynamic retargeting of AVM opcodes into our new VM. So basically, you will be able to run Ethereum applications, and also uh, we, will we will provide our own tool chain for developing applications on the, the, the native uh, VM. But at, the, at this point, compatibility is very important for us. Okay. And, and so why would, uh, so let's say an Ethereum developer who's building smart contracts and Solidity, uh, why would he choose Rootstock as opposed to Ethereum? Is, is there an advantage in your opinion in using Rootstock long-term over Ethereum? Yeah, there, there's, uh, as, as I see, there are several advantages in different areas. From the technical perspective, we are working very, very hard on scalability. And we know that Vitalik is also working on sharding and on other different techniques. Uh, we believe that our our approach is better for scalability, but we will see it. This is healthy competition. And from another perspective, we have a very, very different security model. And I think uh, having this federation that also creates checkpoints is a stronger security guarantee. And because we are uh, uh, selling this uh, platform to financial institutions and banks, we have to give them certain guarantees that essentially Ethereum cannot. We have to give them, for example, our the federation guarantees that the federation is going to check is going to do this checkpointing of, uh, of uh, periodic blocks. So, uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, the, the use cases that we want to be impl see implemented, we need a stronger security model as we are trying to provide. Okay, and also uh, I wanted to ask. Uh, so what is what is the 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 currency that powers uh, rootstock? Like you know, with ether we, with Ethereum we have ether, and uh, is there is there an equivalent in rootstock? Well, it's Bitcoin. Essentially, when you transfer satoshis to a platform, you get more decimal digits, but essentially it's uh, it's it's Bitcoin. So essentially, you pay for fees in Bitcoin, and miners take take their fees on Bitcoin also. 
Okay. And so then in that case, I guess my next question is, so with Ethereum, uh, a lot of the network effect, uh, I think around Ethereum came from the crowd sale and the prospect that, you know, this would become a huge thing and that those who bought Ether may be able to sell Ether uh, down the line at, at a profit, um, ga- uh, capitalizing on, on, on those gains. Uh, and with something like Rootstock, where you don't have that initial, uh, that initial hype I guess around around that currency. Um, what makes you think? What makes you confident that people would use Rootstock as opposed to Ethereum, or, or would sort of onboard massively on this platform? First of all, most of the people that are going to use the smart contract platform are not the people who bought Ethereum on the first place. So the, the people who are really going to benefit from uh, the the SK platform are people who have probably never heard about cryptocurrency. So so uh, I, I see that when it comes to the real world use cases, we will have a certain advantage there to, to really see people uh, using our platform for, for, for real uh, use cases that can benefit uh, r- uh, real people in our countries. Um, so, of course, if you have invested in in the cross sale of Ethereum, you will you will be uh, completely uh, pro Ethereum. Uh, but but we have seen many companies that have invested in, in Ether, and they see us not as a competition, but as a second uh, possibility. If, if something happens to Ethereum, if something goes wrong, and we know that that can happen because every cryptocurrency at this point is just a massive experiment. Uh, so they can have a second opportunity to develop their business. So most of the people have welcomed the existence of a fully compatible uh, platform uh, for for uh, for development of their uh, Ethereum solutions. So we recently did a podcast with uh, with Arthur Brightman, and we talked a bit about the DAO hack and about the EVM and Solidity, and, and he made some very interesting points. Essentially, sort of blaming, uh, at least to some extent, what happened there. Uh, on uh, on the solidity language itself and on the kind of security uh, you know the security provided by EVM and solidity what's your view on that okay there, there are several several things that uh, g- went wrong it's, you cannot uh, put the blame on, on on just one thing uh, for example the solidity language hides the fact that when you are, transferring, you are actually making a call. And so that's one thing that Solidity could, solidity could, could improve. Um, but also a, a DV, EV, EVM layer, uh, essentially there is, a, there, there, there is no recommended way that you can send either without making a call. So, uh, so I, I think there should be a send call that essentially sends either Making sure there is no side effect, and that's a, that's a flaw of the of the EVM that we we have corrected. And but essentially, I, I think that uh, in the, the hype was uh, made investors to be a little blind. I mean, we, when we are developing a, a, a distributed autonomous organization, the first massive uh, DAO, uh, that you are working with a new language with a new kind of uh, surface uh, attack surface, like game theoretic attacks. And also with a new platform, you cannot rely on a single security audit. And that was uh, something that people should know. There should be several security audits for these kind of projects. And a lot of people has to be involved. And if you think about what Ethereum did when they did the first release, they hired three companies to do the security they, they hired list authority they hired coinspec and they, i think they also hired dijabu and the three companies were given the same tasks to audit the code base and to audit the design so i think that that is the right ap- approach that the dao creators should have and I, I i also blame the investors because uh i uh you, you don't you you, you cannot just blindly invest in, in, in a piece of code and, res- and resign to all your uh, legal uh, <laughs> uh, 
reconnaissance. Uh, I don't know any English word for that. Uh, your, your own uh, legal defenses, just because uh, for the hype. Yeah, I, I think I tend to agree with with what you said there, and and I also uh, uh, touching on what Brian said earlier and and Arthur's uh, remarks. Uh, do you think that uh, using a a very basic language, basically essentially uh, d derived from JavaScript like Solidity, uh, rather than some more higher level languages like Cook or some of these other ones, uh, domain specific languages? Do you think that that would uh, be something that should be implemented in these smart contract platforms, or are languages like Solidity suitable uh, at this stage? The, the base layer of, uh, of the EVM allows you to implement any kind of compiler for domain-specific languages. And it's up to researchers, it's up to people to implement them. So what we have now is a general purpose language, uh, which is Solidity, which uh, it's uh, still very immature. And uh, but it's the best we have. So uh, what 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 I think is that having a general purpose language does not mean that anyone is able to create a smart contract. And we, we have to 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 trust uh, people with a security background to write these smart contracts. Uh, it's not just that anyone can write a smart contract. It's a different security model. It's a different platform. It's a completely different what has been developed until today. So uh, even if this looks like HubScript, but, but it's not because it's typed. So it's, if it looks like HubScript, that doesn't mean that anyone should jump and start uh, writing contracts that uh, handle millions of, uh, of dollars. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a cryptocurrency wallet designed by the people at Decentral. Maybe you've been thinking of buying Ether, but haven't gotten around to it because you didn't know what wallet to use, which one is easy, which one is secure, etc. Well, there's an easy way now, and that way is JAX. JAX easily and securely stores both Bitcoin and Ether. Not only does it store those currencies, you can convert them right in the app. So the, with built-in Shapeshift integration, you can, for instance, transfer Bitcoin into the wallet and directly convert it into Ether or vice versa. And since there's only one seed, it's easy to back up and it's easy to sync. JAX has wallets for literally every platform, every device, for Mac, Windows, Linux, iOS, Android, or extension wallets for Chrome and Firefox. JAX is made by the people of Decentral, and they have a proven track record of awesomeness. In 2013, they created CryptoKit. That was the very first browser extension Bitcoin wallet at the time, and the way to think about JAX is that it's CryptoKit on steroids. If there was doping controls for cryptocurrency wallets, JAX would be illegal, highly illegal. Fortunately, they're not. And the great thing too about the Decentral team is just they keep putting out new features and new features for JAX and it just keeps getting better and better. At a, at a disturbing pace, I would like to add. So go to JAX.io, that's J-A-X-X.io, to download your wallet and you'll understand what it's like to use a next generation cryptocurrency wallet. We would like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. So what's, where's Rootstock app at the moment? Like when is it going to launch? Uh, how far is the development? Uh, the, the, the development is running very uh, fast here. We have, uh, I don't know if uh, you see that, but we have the group of programmers just behind me. Um, um, working here in Buenos Aires. And uh, the, the roadmap is that in September, we will have the first public testnet, but the launch of the platform will be on December. So we will have from September to December to do security audits, external security audits, to improve several areas, to test, to, to, um, to do whatever is needed to make sure that the platform is ready for, for launch time. And if, if we detect anything uh, that uh, g doesn't give us enough confidence, then we will postpone the launch date. So uh, we, will, we want to make sure that uh, Rootstock is launched with, uh, when it's fully secured. So talking about Roost, Rootstock, the company, what's the business model here? Uh, RSK, uh, which is the company developing the, the blockchain, uh, earns 20% uh, of the fees that uh, users pay. So this is a pay-per-use model. And we have to use this, uh, this model because we, we, there is no pre-mine. So uh, this is uh, just, uh, so we will win, we will earn, we will uh, fulfill our, our project 
if the platform is used by people. So um, that, that's our aim. We want to see a huge volume of transactions, a uh, huge volume of people benefiting from our platform. And that's how we will earn uh, the, our salaries. Okay, great. So presumably RSK, you know, it's going to be open source, of course, right? So mm -hmm. uh, your idea would then be a little bit like with Ethereum, right? They, they put all this money into developing open source code and then deployed it and people had the same sort of thinking. But what if just somebody else comes along, you know, forks it, deploys it separately? So you, you have the kind of same expectation that because you know, you're the ones developing it, you're setting up all the uh, merged mining setup, et cetera, that, you know, that's the one that will be used and not some other RSK type. So I don't believe that that will happen because what's the incentive for that? I mean, um, essentially, we are relying on the, on the Bitcoin miners for doing merged mining. So why why would merge the, the, the Bitcoin miners with the, we are which are part of the Rootstock, which are which are part of this platform and can and can take a part of a decision making of this platform, uh, start merge mining a, a completely uh, clone of our platform uh, for no reason. I mean we are giving them uh, eighty percent of the the revenue. So uh, how to, <laughs> uh, we are only keeping enough uh, for us to to fulfill our view. And uh, and to to keep on improving, to keep on uh, in, uh, working for the platform to be to be to have more value. So I don't see that happening. And at the same time, it it was very hard, and it's very important for us to have this uh, federation. It's uh, I I don't think other companies can can be in a position to 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 bring together the the main companies of the Bitcoin ecosystem uh, in the same table. Uh, and 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 uh, as we have done. So moving on, then uh, in the in the white paper, you mentioned the upcoming halving, uh, which is the block reward halving, uh, and the impacts that that could have on on Bitcoin. Can you talk to us about some? You know, what are your opinions on uh, what we should see happen in a couple of days now? Oh, I'm very very positive uh, that current uh, the with the current price of Bitcoin, uh, there won't be any. Uh, miners uh, uh, dropping uh, the, the, the mining business. Uh, and I, I see Bitcoin very strong now. So I, I don't think that any, 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 anything's gonna, uh, any bad is going to happen with the halving. On the contrary, I think that, uh, that uh, the Bitcoin price will go up. But one of the, 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 the aims of our project was to give more value to Bitcoin. So in the future halvings, there will be more use cases. There will be more uh, because of uh, Bitcoin is uh, uh, it's uh, limited uh, at the current state in the number of transactions per second that can be handled. We want this to, to the Bitcoin uh, unit of account to be able to handle hundred payments per second, thousand payments per second, and uh, and this will bring a lot of value to Bitcoin and a lot of income to the miners. So we are uh, confident that in the future halvings. Uh, RSK will have an a important role to maintain their their um, their possibility to keep on mining. Yeah, I agree. It, it's been it's been quite fortunate, you no, know, for the Bitcoin price to just sort of like pick up uh, shortly before uh, the happening. I think if I had gone the other way around, it, it might it, it could have looked quite differently. And and I know we we did a podcast before, which was quite a while ago, where we were sort of running through the scenarios, you know, what happens now, the, uh, the price drops, especially, uh, you know, lots of miners become unprofitable, drop off, how could one attack it? But uh, I, I also think that's actually doesn't look too likely at the moment, at least that's my uh, feeling. Uh, so, so to end briefly on one topic, uh, you're based in Buenos Aires, the, all of Rootstock is based in Buenos Aires. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's going on with Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, blockchain in, in South America in general and in Argentina in particular? Well, uh, I'm going to talk about my uh, view because um, uh, um, I've participated in the, in the, the different conferences in South America, but one of the co-founders of uh, RSK, which is Diego, uh, he's actually one of the founders 
of Bitcoin in, in many of these countries. He, he's one of the main promoters. So uh, I, I think Diego is a great person to talk more about that. But what I see, uh, especially in Argentina, is that uh, we, have, we have no trust in banks. We, ha we have a history of capital controls that do not allow people to, to move their own money. Uh, have have numerous stories of people trying to 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 move their own money from 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 their own accounts, having trouble doing that. So uh, I think that uh, Bitcoin has has shown uh, a lot of people here that there is a there is a way to escape that uh, that that uh, that uh, that uh, controls that basically uh, uh, restrict the freedom of people. So uh, I I see that. Uh, that that has uh, given a lot of adoption. But now that I think of RSK, I think that uh, uh, there is a lot more to lot more space to go. And uh, Diego is working with uh, with the poor people uh, here in Argentina uh, in pilot programs to allow cryptocurrency of small communities uh, to be used. And I think that's a, a great place to start to start seeing what. Uh, people requirements, people necessities, and see how cryptocurrency can help them. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask about the transaction volume. Is Do we see a lot of uh, Bitcoin payments, for example, in, in Argentina? I know there was once a New York Times article that said that lots of people in Argentina are using it, to, you know, freelancers working abroad and they're getting paid like that. Uh, is that something that's uh, picking up or where do you see that? Uh, it's it's very difficult from an individual perspective if you are not in the in, in top of an organization to to measure the number of transactions. Uh, I move in a circle of people where where all everyone uses Bitcoin for for uh, for everyday th things like paying uh, f uh, lunch to uh, or, or anything. So for me, using Bitcoin is a day to day experience. But uh, it's very hard to me for uh, talking about about uh, the, the, the whole uh, the country. Probably there is no use of Bitcoin outside Buenos Aires. So uh, it, it, my experience uh, with Bitcoin is, uh, does not represent uh, the use of Bitcoin in, in, the, in the full country. Uh, but in Buenos Aires, is there like a whole range in Palermo where you are range of places yes. that are accepted? And there are, yes. Yes. Hotels also use uh, Bitcoins to to allow you to pay, yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, um, Sergio, thanks so much for coming on. It was a, it was a great pleasure uh, talking with you and it was uh, fa fascinating learning uh, about RSK. I think this is a extremely exciting project and I, I can't wait to see how it turns out and to see what kind of impact it will have. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Sebastian. It was a pleasure to talk to you and uh, just uh, call me whenever you want to uh, keep on these uh, exciting conversations. Sure, we'll we'll have you back on uh, perhaps in a few months when the when the platform's out and ready, and we start seeing use cases come uh, coming up. Uh, where can people find you? Read up. Of course, we have links to all this in the show description. But where can people find Rootstock information about Rootstock, the white paper, all that stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, all the information is on rsk.co, which is our new website, and um, there's there's a couple of uh, white papers there. And we will be uh, presenting new white papers about different technologies of the platform uh, as soon as we uh, do the the public uh, the public uh, testnet, the first public testnet. We are preparing for that point. So stay tuned to 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 the, the rsk.co website, please. Excellent. Yeah, and we have links to that in the white paper, and of course uh, in the show notes. So thanks so much. Uh, Epson Bitcoin is part of the LTB network, Let's Talk Bitcoin network. So you can find this show and other shows at letstalkbitcoin.com. Um, yeah, we put out new episodes every Monday. You can get it on iOS, Android, and of course, videos on youtube.com slash Bitcoin. And if you'd like, you can also leave us an iTunes review and, uh, and send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and then we'll, we'll send you one of those uh, t-shirts. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.